Ladies and gentlemen, we would like this discussion to be an exchange of positions and arguments. While apparently banal, often when two poles sit down to a discussion, instead of such an exchange of arguments, we get either a falsely understood democracy, where the term means complete agreement and harmony, or we get just the opposite a falsely understood anarchy, represented by complete chaos, confusion, and pedophagory. I hope we'll be able to avoid that situation. To begin with, both of us would like to make brief statements regarding what we'll try to prove in this discussion. I would like to remind you that the terms such as democracy, anarchy, absolutism are not univocal at all. They exhibit all the colors of the rainbow. Using that as my starting point, I would like to lead you to a perfidious conclusion that democracy and anarchy are not opposites, like fire and water, but that in a well-developed and stable democracy, a modicum of anarchy is helpful and desirable. Do you agree with me, or do you continue to stubbornly hold to your wrong opinions? I hope we shall not come to an agreement and confuse this scientific conference with a peace conference. I'd like to put this matter in a historical context. My first thesis is that Poland's collapse was not a result of anarchy. If it had occurred immediately after the first partition of Poland, and if that partition had been the only one, we would have had no defense when judged by history. But we were murdered by three great empires at the very moment we showed that we could exist independently on the political stage in Europe. My second thesis is that I absolutely do not believe that certain anomalies in today's parliamentary and political life, in the broadest sense of the word, were some sort of reference, whether conscious or not, to our worst traditions, that of the anarchy of our 18th century nobility. I feel that they are simply a consequence of the fact that politicians active in the Third Republic had nowhere to practice, that they operated under conditions of a false democracy, while only open political life can be a school for politicians, members of parliament, or the government. Democracy is a mystification. It pours sand into the eyes of the people because it promises that the people will govern. While this is not true, and impossible. The truth is that in no democracy do the people government. They merely give the investiture to govern and later retract it. And so, from this point of view, democracy and anarchy completely rule each other out. I would like to defend another thesis, which I will get to later. But first, I would like to return to what I mentioned earlier, that neither democracy nor anarchy nor any other political terms are univocal. For example, we take democracy. I once had the pleasure of arguing with a very nice fellow, Mr. Zbigniew Bujak, who explained to me that democracy either existed or it didn't. While I attempted to convince him that democracy can differ, that it is gradable and not at all univocal.
As to anarchy, I am grateful to the great philosophers of anarchy. And so I would like to say that we have a bad habit of confusing anarchy in its philosophical and socio-political meaning with common dissension and pedophagory. They are, of course, completely different things. Anarchy is a concept as old as history, which, like all categories of political philosophy, was invented by the Greeks, who knew everything about politics. Political philosophy is like Ravel's Bolero. The motifs are always the same, only the instrumentation changes. They too had a univocal view of what was anarchy. If, for example, we were to ask Herodotus what it was, he would give an answer that also suits me, that anarchy is a social state where there is no authority. It can be deemed either positive or negative. In this case, anarchy is neutral. However, if we were to ask Plato, he would say that anarchy is a condition of complete disorder, mayhem, chaos, and pedophagy. Let's not confuse these issues. Dissension, so characteristic of various phases in our history, need not be described as anarchy. I do not think we should mystify current reality. In the first place, it's not true that everyone wants to take part in direct democracy and participate in governing the nation. I submit that a significant number of Poles are tired of having to think for their politicians and economists. In Western societies, everyone minds their own business and understands that their representatives in Parliament or government are there to rule the country. In Poland, however, there's still the feeling that in addition to being a doctor, biologist or teacher, I must also worry about the fate of my country because those at the wheel don't do it very well. Another thing, I sense a growing yearning in Poland to return to a strong central authority, a situation similar to that in 1925-26, when there was a feeling that the parliamentary experiment had failed and that someone ought to come and clean out the corruption. Thus we had Piłsudski and his sanacja regime. But Piłsudski had just completed the successful campaign of 1920 and had the swords of the legionnaires supporting him. Currently, I do not see such a strong person. In a word, there is a clear parliamentary crisis, which is not to say that we've fallen into complete anarchy. But regarding the objections Professor Bashkevich mentioned, I'd like to recall the words of my catechist, a Jesuit of course, who asked us why all authority derives from God. None of us knew the answer, because even the worst authority is better than anarchy, he told us. My question to the professor is this. Does he know of any system, any political system, based solely on anarchy, which has lasted for a longer period of time in a given country and which has not led to the downfall of that country? As to your thesis, professor, that not everyone has a responsibility to be involved in politics, veto. Or if we want democracy in Poland or anywhere else to function properly, one fundamental condition must be met, something without which democratic mechanisms do not function properly, and that is political participation. Involvement by citizens in political life. Yes, but the ideal in the West is such that I go to the polls every so often and choose a party to rule the country for the next few years. And I can rest assured that it is then on the right course and not this constant participation in political life. For God's sakes, take the case of what the press writes about in the West. Are the front pages only filled with political stories?
My dear professor, you just stated that we are living through a crisis of our representative system, which, of course, is the truth. And if we really are experiencing a parliamentary crisis, then we need to think about the forms of political participation, that which we call direct democracy, and about participation in public life. Otherwise, the prospects for democracy, both here and in the West, won't be the brightest. The period that Ovid once described as the Golden Age isn't simply a poet's creation. Indeed, people lived without formal political authority or legal systems for tens of thousands of years. This situation indeed turned out to be insupportable, and I'm not an advocate of life in a nationless society, for that would be utopia. But let us not say that the nation-state has always existed. It probably always will in the future. So let us ensure that it always looks its best and is most comfortable for us. However, it's not the case that one cannot live without a nation. Dear Professor, you rather carelessly used the word utopia. It appears you still believe in the paradise of primitive society. And in the second place, it reminds me of an answer given by a student to the question of what was the basis of Neminem Captivabimus. He said that many years ago in Poland, no one could be arrested without their consent. My fear is that today we are shifting in that direction. Lenin was fundamentally wrong regarding many issues, but he was right on one. The nation must fulfill the function of violence towards those it considers harmful to society. It cannot avoid doing that. Primitive society was certainly no paradise on earth. But that which you expressed in your anecdote on Neminem Captivabimus is no more than a sighing for dissension, which has returned numerous times in our history. Not to any Polish anarchy, but to Polish dissension, Polish petifagri. Of course, it's not a unique event in history. As I've praised the ancient Greeks, I'll say that dissension and pedophagory blossomed in that wonderful Greek democracy. Poland is no exception here. You've anticipated my question, Professor. In 17th century France, wasn't the Fronde an example of classic dissension? No, the Fronde was silliness. But you know that Samuel Wascht was considered a classic symbol of Polish dissension, and who had 300 sentences for banishment sewed into the lining of his fur coat. Meanwhile, a number of years after Mr. Wascht's death, the Parisian Supreme Court, in a traveling session, one of the judges wrote a statement, a memoir of the visit, wherein he wrote that signs of terrifying dissension, that of the nobility, as in Poland, exceeded our wildest expectations. And that was something much worse than what could be found in 17th century Poland. So it's not a Polish gene. No, it's not. But as the Holy Scripture says, by their fruits you shall know them. If Poland hadn't lost its independence, we would view Polish political life in the 17th century completely differently. To this day in Denmark, whenever there's a stormy meeting which brings no effects, it's referred to as a Polish parliament. Why is it that in contemporary historiography there is a conviction that Poland lost its reason for being because of dissension? Because it did, whereas France managed to overcome that. And I find it humorous, and I say this to you as an outstanding scholar of history, that those who came to power under the banner of curtailing authority received the greatest amount of power. 
Cromwell versus the King, Robespierre versus Louis XVI, not to mention Lenin and Stalin versus the unfortunate Nicholas II. Right, as to the first matter. The absolutism, which seems to be the best prescription for Polish dissension, of course turns out not to be so. I'd like to again point out that the concept of absolutism is not univocal either. Spanish absolutism, about which you wrote in today's Gazeta Wyborcza, and which did not prevent the collapse of Spain, was a stupid sort of absolutism. While at practically the same time, Elizabethan absolutism was an excellent invention. The absolutism of Henry IV was very intelligent and useful for the country. However, the slightly younger Ivan the Terrible created an absolutism in Russia which was a classic example of stupidity and irresponsibility. Again, absolutism can be good or it can be bad. Why it was impossible in Poland is another matter. I just want to say that the history of Mr. Wascht is not proof of any inborn dissension in Poland's nobility, simply because a number of years before Mr. Wascht, that same Polish nobility proved its political and legal culture during the executive same. What changed during those intervening 80 or 90 years? On the one hand, the role and authority of the Republic weakened and the role of oligarchs increased. Why was Mr. Wascht able to line his coat with banishment orders? Because he had the protection of Hetman Koniecpolski, isn't that right? Indeed, and furthermore, instead of going in the direction of maintaining and expanding a powerful nation, we decided to go against the dissension of the great magnate families. Thus, saying that anarchy, dissension, is not anything worthy. Not at all, of course. Furthermore, I support your conclusion that if today we have examples of such dissension, it is because we have not had any training in democracy for a long time. Let me add that when democracy appeared in its modern form in Europe some 200 years ago, what happened in Poland was quite unique. During that period, during which our forefathers could have lived in conditions of democratic freedom, shameful and troublesome things began to happen. We removed the shackles of Russian authority, the November uprising took place, and what happened then we can read about in Bochnatsky's works. Then there followed the great post-uprising emigration, which was a marvelous clinical example of dissension, scourges, lies, untimely intentions, belated bitterness, and hellish squabbles. Years later, a democratic Poland was born. In February of 1919, the very successful dictatorship of Józef Piłsudski was turned over to the parliament, and once again shameful and troublesome things began to happen. The old Polish dissension returned again. Finally, after the collapse of the authoritarian Sanatia regime, we had another wave of emigration. Not only during the war, which muffled the expression and dissension somewhat, but what happened after 1945 with the immigrant community in London. One simply needs to read the reports by Jan Lehoin, who was not suspected of being against the immigrants. Once again, these are also shameful and troublesome things. Finally, we have the 4th of June, 1989. For a year afterward, there is a democratic euphoria. 
After which, a war at the top erupts, with all its consequences. I'll tell you honestly, I can imagine, with all due respect, Lech Wałęsa wearing a robe and brandishing not a war axe, but a curved sword as a representative to Parliament in open battle for the seat, making mincemeat out of his opponents.